Welcome to the EXP Group's discussion of SEMA paper P2 on performance management. Um, we're going to look at some divisional level performance measures, starting with the return on investment. Um, now, the return on investment uh, notion is uh, a, an attempt to look at not simply the profitability of a division, but to understand whether they are generating sufficient profitability given the amount of uh, capital that they have invested in the division. This is referred to as the capital employed. We can refer, we can understand this as being capital resources that are tied up in the division, which are allocated to the division and which they need to uh, generate a return on. So a simple measure of ROI would be net profit at the divisional level. We could understand net profit as being profit generated before uh, tax. For the sake of uh, clarity, we could say that the ROI is typically used um, as an investment appraisal technique, and it would be typically encountered at the divisional level when spending or investment decisions, capex division, uh, decisions are being made. And we can use a similar kind of uh, uh, measurement uh, at the corporate level, and we refer to this as the return on capital employed. Now, the interesting thing is from a behavioral point of view, what happens at the divisional level. Um, for example, if a division is generating an ROI of 20%, um, and if they're performance is based on highest ROI achieved, it's very possible that such a division then would reject projects which are um, offering only 15%. Now, let's switch over to the corporate level. and Let's say the return on investment target for the corporation as a whole is 12% and that anything in excess of 12 is quite acceptable to the company as a whole. One can see that in the case of rejecting a 15% um, project at the division level, the division will have made a, a, um, a decision which will be at variance with the overall interests of the corporation as a whole. A very good example of lack of congruence in interests and decision making. Now, one way of uh, possibly getting around this problem, because the ROI measure is a, is a percentage return, is to uh, try to convert it to a monetary amount. And the residual income is defined as a division, at the divisional level, as the earnings before interest and in taxes um, generated by the division, less the imputed interest on the capital which is tied up in, in that division. Now, the imputed interest comes from a capital employed number, the capital employed at the division, times a charge for that capital or a cost of capital. And we could frame the residual income rule as being any project generating a positive RI should be accepted. In such a case, we could see that uh, using the RI concept would help uh, solve the problem posed by this, um, this division rejecting a 15% ROI project. Now, the drawbacks of RI and ROI, we'll take them together as a group. Um, let's just run through an example here numerically. Let's say we have an ROI of 12% and a new project will require uh, an investment of $4.5 million and it will generate cash inflows of $1.5 million. Let's forget about taxes for the moment. And let's assume the cost of capital for the company is 10%.
Now, if we map out the uh, results for the company projected over four years, we have the initial capital investment of 4.5 million, which is going to be depreciated on a straight line basis throughout the life of the project. Here are the net cash inflows, which are equal annual flows. And here is our depreciation expense, which is taken out of the net. It, it diminishes the net book value, as you can see step by step. These are the uh, equal annual depreciation amounts, straight line basis, which gives us a profit of 375 in each of the years. Now, the interesting thing is if we do the residual income calculation, we have to take a capital charge of 10% on the net book value for the given year. We can see here that as the asset value, the net book value um, reduces, the capital charge is going to go down, and therefore the residual income will go up over the period. And in fact, it starts with a, a negative number and then becomes very strongly positive later on. Same thing's true of the return on investment. We can see that an 8% return on investment, which is derived by dividing the profit, 375 in the first year, by 4.5 million. The return on investment is actually going to increase as well through the period because we have a constant profit figure which is uh, being divided by a reducing net book value figure. Again, these are, these are simply the consequences of using accounting-based um, figures in order to generate both our residual income and our return on investment figures. So we can see here that if we're looking at a very short term, the investment may still be rejected because both the RI and the ROI look deficient, even though the project as a whole uh, tends to look better over time. Now, attempts have been made to escape this accounting bias by the development of the uh, technique called economic value added, or AVA. Now, AVA bears a superficial resemblance to residual income in that AVA, the economic value added, is defined as being a a uh, cash-based profit calculation called net operating profit after tax or NOPAT. Uh, this is a cash-based uh, profit that the company generates or, or at the division level generated over a period minus a, um, a charge for the capital employed. So again, this is um, follows the, the structure of the residual income um, calculation. However, the AVA is much more sophisticated because it looks to uh, adjust financial statements in order to determine what the proper level of capital employed is in a business. And it also seeks to extract from the uh, financial statements um, and, and adjust the uh, income uh, figure to arrive at this net operating profit after tax. So it's a cash-based way of uh, tracking the true economic value that's created or destroyed at a firm over, over a period of time. So the devil in the AVA uh, method lies in the adjustments that need to be made. And in our overview here, while we cannot be exhaustive with respect to the adjustments made, if one goes back to the uh, Stern-Stewart uh, literature, and those the, that is the, uh, the firm that developed this method, they, they speak of uh, uh, perhaps over a hundred adjustments that would uh, have to be made to the financial statements. Um, for the purpose of uh, our understanding of AVA at this, this level of SEMA, it is sufficient to appreciate that the capital employed um, number will be uh, constructed by adding back or including in the balance sheet or in the capital employed figure any off-balance sheet debt, for example, operating leases, adding back a cumulative goodwill and uh, accounting or, or financial depreciation, which may have been uh, passed through the books, adding back provisions for bad debts, 
So we're looking at uh, non-cash items here and also intangibles, research and development, advertising and the like. All these things have to be added back because they represent um, investment spending, which uh, even if the accounting rules require they re be removed or written off from the balance sheet, they still should count um, uh, in the capital employed total. Because the capital employed effectively is uh, represents the figure, the total resources that a company um, uses, which uh, has been sourced from capital providers, that is those people lending and investing in the company. Similarly, uh, out of the income statement, in order to extract or, or derive a NOPAT, a, a cash-based um, operating profitability number for the uh, to be used in the AVA calculations, we need to uh, add back to the income goodwill and accounting depreciation, uh, provisions for bad debt expenses. These are almost the corresponding items uh, in, that, that flow through the, that have flown, gone through the uh, income statement as they were written off the balance sheet. Other non-cash expenses, intangibles, and interest uh, expense on debt. So financing uh, costs are not part of the uh, operating expenses. They have to be added back to the income in order to derive our NOPAT figures. So the income statement, it's from there that we make the adjustments to achieve the NOPAT number. It's from the uh, capital employed we take from the balance sheet of the company. And the R, as we've seen before, is the is represented by the uh, represents the cost of capital to the company. In other words, the opportunity cost of employing the capital resources, and this typically will be the weighted average cost of capital for the firm. That will be the number which is used for R.